with us for uh, for our Sunday morning service. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. If y'all had enough to eat, would you say amen? All right, amen. Amen. all right, good. And it's just that, so thankful hearing the testimonies of folks who had folks over and things like that. It really is a blessing, and so we praise the Lord for that. Um, you know, as we come together this morning, it's uh, it's good to be thankful. Amen. It's good to be mindful of the fact that we sell, we come to uh, we meet on Sunday. Um, not because of tradition, say necessarily so much as we come on Sunday because that the early church had met on Sunday morning to celebrate really the resurrection of Christ. Um, and we come every Sunday for that. Um, and so when we come together to hear the word of God, to worship together, understand that we're doing this because we are showing a great gratitude to the Lord for uh, being true to his word. Not just that Jesus died on the cross and was buried for our sins according to the scripture, but he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And uh, we serve a risen Savior. Amen. And so this morning, let's go ahead and stand together and uh, we'll uh, sing our hymn of the month this morning. Uh, he will hold me fast. By the Lord's upon the screen.
preach the message that he has for us, Lord, that he would only say what you would have him to say. And just uh, please help us in all the ways that we need you, Lord, and that's every single area in our life. Uh, just please give us the grace and the patience to, to do what you would have us to do, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time of fellowship. We ask you that you please be with us and we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I remember in verse for the month of November, it's our last Sunday working on this, so let's put all our might into it. Amen. Uh, and also, um, Brother Darrell, would you mind grabbing the offering plates for me just a moment here? We'll have you come forward and pray for offering. And we'll call this verse together, starting with that reference in Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. Ready? Begin. Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Thank you so much, and please be seated. Um, got a few announcements uh, uh, this morning. Of course, don't forget, ladies, on December 17th at 6 p.m. now, we'll have our ladies' Christmas uh, cookie and gift exchange, Christmas cookie and gift exchange. So please, we make marking that on your calendar, and uh, make sure you're coming for that. We're asking, ladies, bring four dozen cookies, all right, because we'll be sharing those amongst each other uh, and bringing those home for the Christmas time. And then also for the gift exchange, nothing more than $20 or 2,000 yen, all right? So just make sure you keep that aware as well. But December 17th, 6 p.m., we will be having food catered in for that. And so um, don't worry about bringing anything as far as food items, uh, but that will be catered in for that. And also men, don't forget, ooh, we're going through a bunch of slides here at one time. Let's go back. There we go. Men's Bible study, December 18th, all right, December 18th. We'll have more details to come on that, but maybe marking that down, it'll be in the evening time for a men's uh, fellowship and Bible study on December 18th, and looking forward to that time together. Also, uh, we want to say a huge thank you to those that came out this past, or yesterday, for, uh, for Gospel Outreach Saturday. Um, redid the count on that, and we had just over 300 Japanese gospel tracks that got out, and about 30 or so uh, English tracks that went out. And so praise the Lord for what was able to be accomplished on Saturday. Um, we got the from, from the main gate all the way down to the 7-Eleven down there. Uh, we, we pretty much got every house in that region. So I'll be praying for the fruit to be uh, apparent from that, that the Lord would bless those efforts with his grace and with his mercy, um, and that we would see more souls saved for his glory. Um, also, um, I think I'm going to do this here before we have our, off, our offertory. Um, there it is. Uh, we have a thank you let card come in from uh, Brother Mike and Miss Jen Helton. Of course, you remember they were they kind of poured it in with us during our mission conference, and we were able to ask them some questions and learn about their uh, how the Lord's using them in high end Spain. And he says, Dear brother and sisters of Faith Baptist Church, thank you so much for allowing us to share what God is doing here in high end Spain. We are encouraged to know God is working all over the world. May God bless you in Christ, Michael and Jen Helton. So we're praying for these missionaries um, as we uh, endeavor to you know, pray for them with our prayer support. And then Lord willing, consider during our uh, annual uh, business meeting uh, whether we'll be taking them on for support as well. And so thank you so much for your consideration of that. We're we'll praying for uh, Mike and Jen. Um, they also have two children, and they're in college. Um, and so pray for them as well uh, as they, uh, during this holiday season, they'll be apart from each other, that God would give them uh, the grace they need for those for these days. Amen. All right, Brother Darrell, would you mind praying for our offering, sir? Yes, sir. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church family. We pray that you bless these tithes and offerings and that you use them for your will. We pray that you bless, bless those who faithfully give back what is already yours. And we thank you for these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
chapter number two this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter two, continuing our series in a resilient church. How can we nurture resilience as individuals as we walk with the Lord and as a consequence produce a resilient church for God's glory? 2 Thessalonians chapter two. Also, it was good to, uh, while we were out doing visitation Saturday, had a chance to team up with Ramon and uh, good to be with him and we had some good conversation and uh, heard his testimony and uh, he's looking to join the church but he's got to get baptized amen and so it's going to be a little cold not as cold as february but it's going to be a little cold so we're going to get that knocked out in the next couple weeks here and so you pray for him and we'll get you some details on that and uh, hey the, it's, it's kind of like a football team in the middle of winter when the snow is falling it's hard to play in the cold when there's nobody around to cheer you on amen and so when we do have this baptism day Get you a warm jacket, come on out and cheer him on, amen, because we're going to be out there in the cold weather, and it'll all be good. Uh, but praise the Lord for how God's working in his life, and praying for God to give him wisdom in the days ahead, amen. Let's go ahead and uh, stand together. If you found your place there, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll be in verse number 1 this morning, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, and so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now yet, uh, you know what behold, withholdeth that he, that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him 
whose coming is after the work of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Father, we come to you now. We ask your blessing on the reading, preaching, and teaching of your word. Lord, we need your grace this morning. We need your mercy. We need your wisdom. Father, if we, uh, even if we put forth our best efforts and you're, and you're not in those efforts, then really it'll all still be empty. But Lord, if we put our efforts into your hands and we trust you for the grace to accomplish what you desire us to do, trust in your spirit to lead in the way you want us to go, and Lord, great things can be accomplished here today. Lord, I don't know what hearts are like that came in today. I know where my heart's at. And Lord, I ask you, Father, to help us all, Lord, to check whatever might be on our, what might, what might be weighing our thoughts down this morning at the door. Let us fix our eyes upon you. Look full in your wonderful face. Let the things of this earth grow strangely dim so we can behold you for who you are. God, help us this morning to be helped to be resilient today. We commit these things to your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and please be seated. When I was growing up in South Carolina, we spent some time kind of studying state history as part of my fourth grade reading, uh, fourth grade class uh, curriculum. And um, I don't have all the details with me today, but I remember vividly talking about the about Fort Sumter and how Fort Sumter came under a barrage of uh, cannon uh, fire from the ships in the bay. But for whatever reason, Fort Sumter wouldn't fall. And they tried to figure out what, what was the reason for that. Why, why was Fort Sumter so resilient? Well, because it was built with palmetto trees. And palmetto trees, because of where they grow and what they're made of, are very fibrous and they're very flexible. And quite literally, as the cannonballs would be fired on Fort Sumter, the cannonballs would bounce off and fall back in the water. And it was a, such a, it was a resilient fort, and it was renowned for that reason. So much so that today, if you look at the flag of South Carolina, you see a palmetto tree on that flag, and that's the reason uh, you have that there. Um, as a little bit of state history, but it wouldn't be history, and it wouldn't be prominent if it wasn't for its resilience. Do you imagine if they'd made a, um, a made a fort out of the wood we use today, an MDF particle board? It wouldn't last long, would it? Just put right on through. No one would, uh, no one would survive it. Uh, but God doesn't call us to be brittle and dry and strengthless. God calls us to be resilient so that we can stand fast in days of adversity. We looked last week about how the devil, this world, um, and all that this present age is, is trying to get us shaken in mind um, to be troubled out of deceit. And if we're going to have resilient faith, we cannot be cast down from a secure and happy state. We cannot be shaken no, rather, we must, from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, allow our hearts and minds to be transformed by the unfailing truth of God's Word so that we can prove or test or try what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If we're able to test the things we're seeing, test the things we're hearing, examine the things we're being told to believe and told to make part of our lifestyle or our philosophies and scrutinize them by the Word of God, then we won't be soon shaken. We will stand resilient in the face of devilish deceit. We want to prove, we want to try, we want to see what is acceptable to God. What, 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 what is a matter of, uh, of sanctification powered by the grace of God? What makes us pleasing to the Lord? The mark of a true disciple, we said, of Christ is not an attitude of licentiousness, what can I get away with, but of devotion-driven pursuance of the glory of God. You mark down a carnal, uh, weak-minded, weak-willed Christian as someone who tries to see what they can get away with with God. But a Christian, a, a believer who shows the marks of maturity in their walk with God, seeks to do all they can with every aspect of their life to give glory to God. So what's the scripture for that? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Well, therefore, you need to drink what you do to all the glory of God. We, went, we learned that verse together, and it was on purpose because that is an essential verse for sanctification in the Christian life. God does care what you think. God does care what you say. God does care what you eat, drink, or do. God cares. And if God cares, then He, and because He's God, He deserves for us to give those things to Him and rely upon Him to give peace or to take away what is not pleasing to him. Philippians 1, 9 through 11, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, 
which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. We live our lives so that we can bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. And yet, as we, as we walk away from this danger of deception that permeates our age, as we understand that there is going to come a great falling away, this one of the most alarming markers of the end of the last days, leading into the uh, the tribulation and the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, the, this reality that, that that the vast majority of people that claim to know God and claim to follow God will in fact be believing a deception or believing a, believing a lie and will have no power of God in their life. Um, and a matter of fact, we're told. Paul tells Timothy, what? From such, turn away. Why? Well, Paul tells the church of Ephesus some things about this. He says, verse 11 through 16 in Ephesians 4, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body is fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love." A resilient church can only be a a reality when the believers who make up that local body are individually pursuing growth by the Word of God and when they as individuals are committed to assembling together in the Word to be edifying and encourage one another by the Word of God. And you mark this down. When you are fully pursuing the doctrines of the Scriptures, when you are trying to follow biblical Bible thinking and Bible doctrine, you will find people, by God's grace, that will be the same mind. God has a way of bringing people like that together. Amen? And as He brings people like that together, they must make a decision that they're going to stand fast in those things. Because the vast majority of people in in our day, as a matter of fact, if if you're paying any attention to a lot of modern Christendom, what you see is this, this... animosity toward doctrine. You ever heard the statement, doctrine divides, but love unites? You ever heard that before? I've heard that before. Um, in other words, what they say is, look, it, it, doctrine's not important. What matters is love. Do we love Jesus? Do we love each other? And if we just love each other and love Jesus, then we can all be unified. That is heresy. Because what truly unites a body of believers is not just love, though we should love one another, but primarily Doctrine. What we believe about God from His Word. Because if we're following just love and emotionalism, and if we're just following experientialism, if we're just following what we think rather than what is true, then we'll all have our own doctrine, and we'll be carried about with every wind of doctrine. And before long, you'll find yourself, like what Paul says, they'll be heaping to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's what makes YouTube so dangerous sometimes. I get a little nervous about you using YouTube up on, 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 on for our church because, you know, you put this on the channel and it's a blessing to do. Amen. But, you know, if we're going to be able to do it, we're going to do it. But the reality is YouTube is centered around your preferences. What do you want to hear? And so before long, you, you cater your channel of things you want to see to what you like to hear and you heap to yourself teachers because what you hear feels good. It messes with what your philosophies are. That's a dangerous proposition. So much so, especially in the age we live in, as we come into what we're talking about today, because everything that is in this world and everything that's going to affect this world moving forward in these last days will stand in opposition to God. Look at, you see it here in 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, what is going to characterize this Antichrist or son of perdition? Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So in other words, as we look at the first part this morning, the, 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 the sentiment of this individual and the sentiment of the age will be a sentiment of opposition toward everything that is godly. 
biblically godly. I'm not. This is what's so amazing about this, because the, the closer we get to uh, the return of Jesus Christ, the closer we get to the rapture and the tribulation and all that, the closer we get, the more religious this world is going to become. But it's not going to be what we, what we think religion ought to be. It's going to be a religion of self. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, the Bible says. Have you all been watching the news the last couple of weeks? Pay attention to this last month. This is some really interesting stuff happening right now. I'm not talking, I'm not trying to, to, to read into things that aren't there. I'm not going to be that, you know, that, that guy who tells you that to look around under every rock for something. But I am telling you, you pay attention because our age, our day is turning into something that is very, very interesting. Because it is opening wide the doors for the fulfillment of what we see in scriptures. We live in an age where there will be an increasing opposition to all that names the name of Jesus Christ. And this is why we need to be careful. Hold your place here and look over at Galatians with me. Galatians chapter 1. Because if we're not careful, we'll be deceived. We'll see this opposition... And we'll, put our, and we'll find ourselves embracing people who name the right terminology but do not follow the same bibliology. Verse number 6, Galatians chapter 1, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. That's a very important phrase. Because what, this, what Paul is writing about here is he's saying there are people who are going to use Bible words to preach another gospel that is not biblical. So, Christian here, mark this down. Okay, Make sure you write it down in your heart and mind or on a piece of paper. Hey, there are people on YouTube and on Facebook and on Twitch, whatever it might be, that might use Christian terminology, but they're teaching heresy. Not everything everybody says with Bible words is worth listening to. You say, well, how do I judge that? How do I discern that? Hey, you won't be soon shaken in mind if the Word of Christ dwells in you richly. The Word of God is your sifting tool to ensure that you're hearing good Bible doctrine. He says here, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert or contort and twist the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be embraced, tolerated, understood. That's not what this verse says. It says, let him be accursed. When something is accursed, I mean, let me, let's, let's make it a, a real simple illustration this morning. You go in your home today and you open your door. How many of y'all just love spiders? We just raise your hand. You just love spiders. I don't mind spiders so much. I can especially when I see them. Amen. Yeah. Nobody. How many of y'all detest spiders? You would rather light a match and burn the house down before you let them live in your house with you. Anybody at all? I saw a meme one time that had this little girl out front and her dad was squatting down next to her. And in the background was this house was on fire. And she said, Dad, I found a spider and I burned him. And he said, good girl. <laughs> the house is burning down in the background. Right? So you walk in today. And you walk in your home. And there's you, and you open the door. And there's one of them big old huntsman spiders right there in your floor. It's his house now. It's his house now, right? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you going to greet him by name and let him roam about your home? No. Or are you going to get him out of there? You're going to do the best you can to not... Now, let's, we're all going to need to defend the doubt. Some of y'all going to get a slipper and twist that dude, aren't you? I know it. I can see it. Some of you might be brave enough to get a little, like a little bowl and trap him and put a paper and take it outside. I don't know what you might do. But whatever it might be, you are not going to let that thing in your house. It is going to be to you accursed. It's not worth staying around. I remember being uh, real little. We were in Idaho. And uh, we had moved in this duplex in, in, uh, in Sumter, South Carolina. And... Uh, my brother and I were in bed, all right? We were, we, we were sleeping. Um, I woke up in the morning to a very awkward morning where my mom and my dad had these just had the chuckles. You ever had the chuckles with somebody before? Because something happened. You can't look at each other without laughing. And I'm like, we're like, we missed the joke, right? What's the inside joke here? Well, apparently after moving into this duplex of a home, 
my dad and mom were sitting on the couch and he saw something red on the carpet and he said, honey, did you drop like a ribbon or something on the ground? And she said, well, no. And he went over there to look at it and he came back and jumped on the couch and said, it's a snake. And she said, well, what are you doing on the couch? You're the man. Get the shovel. What in the world, right? And he goes over there and he kills the snake and uh, puts it in the freezer to show us in the morning. That's what good dads do, amen. And, uh, and, and hey, that snake was not welcome in the night household. It was accursed. Christian, if you're going to be resilient in the day and age that you live in, you can't tolerate, hug up on, and embrace false doctrine. You can't try to work your way through it. Well, most of what they preach is okay, but just to get a little squirrely sometimes. People like, uh, I heard recently a sermon, uh, what was his name? Uh, Stephen Furtick, talking about how God broke the law for love. Jesus didn't break the law, he fulfilled the law. And there's a really distinct difference between those two because God is not in righteousness to break the law. So little things like that get slipped in there when you have false teachers. Little things like that get shoved in there and they might say 80% of good things with good Bible terminology, but it's that 20% that will wreck your doctrine and ruin your walk with God. You'll start believing another gospel. That's trouble. That's trouble. Paul says, don't, don't be moved to this another gospel. It's not another gospel. And if anybody comes to you, whether it's us, he says, if I come to your church and preach something else, this heresy, I should be accursed. That's a pretty bold statement, amen. Whether we or an angel from heaven, I don't know why Joseph Smith didn't listen to that verse. This angel Moroni, quote unquote, comes unto him and gives him a, says, hey, the Bible you have is, is all corrupted. So I have the real truth for you. I don't know what kind of vision he had or what he might have done, but he wrote down what he heard, and it's a it's a it's a heresy that the Mormon Church follows today. And yet Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes about that very thing. Though an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Don't tolerate false doctrine. Get rid of it. And annihilate it. Let, it. let it out of your life. Don't give it place in your life. And he says unto you in verse, he says verse number 9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. This is, this is one of the greatest markers of the downslide of modern Christendom today. I remember sitting in school, we read a book called The Pursuit of Purity. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. I encourage you to read it. It is a bit dry because it's a historical book. But The Pursuit of, of, of Purity is a wonderful book that talks about the slide of, 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 of good Bible doctrine. One of the great markers, unfortunately, that marked it was the Billy Graham Crusades. Some of us, most, most of us are way too young to, to remember those things, okay? Um, but you can read about them online. But one of the markers of this was Billy Graham would get up there and he would preach the gospel. And then they would give an invitation for folks to respond to the gospel. But here's the problem: the altar workers, those that were working for the, those that were helping those that were uh, coming forward, were everything from Catholics to Episcopalians to Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses to Protestants to you name it. And they would come; someone would come to them to respond to the gospel. And when they came to talk with that person about the gospel, what would they hear? They would hear another gospel. One would say, hey, you need to go plant a tree for Jesus and establish His kingdom now. One would say, hey, you just need to go get baptized and we'll take care of that. One would say, you need to take the Eucharist and that will receive, you'll receive the grace of God that way. And what happened was, uh, the gospel was preached, but confusion ensued. And all in of tolerance. Our age, if we're going to be a resilient church, it's not that we're hateful. It's not that we're bigoted. It's not that we're unkind or unloving. It's that we need to make sure we know why we believe what we believe so we're not deceived. And then when opposition comes to those beliefs, you're so anchored in them that you will not break under the pressure to cave. Go with me to the book of Daniel. Hold your place here. Actually, hold your place, Second Thessalonians, and go to the book of Daniel. The Old Testament. You go to verse chapter number three. Verse number 
Verse number one, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, the breadth thereof six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Now, I won't read the, so a few of these verses for time's sake, but essentially they all, verse number four, or verse 5, that at the time when the, all these individuals would hear the sound of the cornet, flute, the harp, the sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And they said, spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of these instruments here, verse number 11, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set up over the affairs of the, Babylon, of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, well, well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour in the midst of the same hour, in the midst of this burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Now notice the scene here. God tells his wise men, he says, hey, Everybody who governs, everybody who leads, every leader, ever get your people together. And when you hear this music, I make a decree that you will worship my image. It's a, it's a, it's a law. Okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their Hebrew names are Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They're friends of Daniel. They're the four that stood against the, uh, the decision from Nebuchadnezzar to eat the king's meat. They were proven to be more wise and better than anybody in their peer groups. And so Nebuchadnezzar rewards that with prominence. And so Daniel and these three men all have places of authority in the province of Babylon. So when everybody around, you can imagine the scene, right? Imagine being in a room full of people and you're governing and leading and all of a sudden the music starts and everybody falls in their face and you're all standing there. Not because of consequence, but because of choice kind of stick out like a sore thumb and so the other chief rulers they come to Nebuchadnezzar and say hey we've got a problem some of these Jews aren't falling down to worship you what are you going to do about it well Babylon was a nation ruled by fear and of obedience and so for these three men to not obey Nebuchadnezzar's name or, or command was a sign of weakness for Nebuchadnezzar you could not let that happen so what happens? He brings these men and he gives them the benefit of the doubt. He says, look, maybe you didn't hear it. Maybe you were busy and didn't hear the music. I'll tell you what, let's have a do-over. When you hear the music and you bow down, all is well. Don't worry about it. I'll be appeased. Just in case you did hear it and you hear it again and you don't bow down, just so you know from me, you'll be in that fiery furnace and there's no God in heaven or hell that can deliver you. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. What did they do? This is some serious opposition, is it not? Hey, when it comes to the to the true mark of the beast that comes during the tribulation, by the way, we've not seen it yet, okay? It doesn't exist today. There are some precursors. We see some things that are putting the oh, they're beginning the mechanics of something like that. But one day there's going to be a mark that is going to be put in the forehead or right hand of an individual. And it will be a purposeful mark that's received to align themselves not just with that government, 
with the Antichrist, but with the world, the one world religion, the great whore of Babylon. That is what it's going to be. No one's going to get it on accident. They will receive that mark. And those that don't receive the mark will not be able to buy, sell, trade, or live in that economy without it. They were, they were, this is an example of the kind of opposition that will be had during these days. What was their response? Verse number 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. So we're not scared of you. Verse 11, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known to thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. How in the world could these three men look the king in the face and without fear and trepidation, say, look, king, you do what you want to, but we will not bow to your image because our God can deliver us. They had an unwavering faith, but they also had an unwavering commitment. But if he doesn't, even if he lets us burn in that fiery furnace, he's still God and we won't bow down to you. See, here's the difference, Christian. When you go back to our text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the reason there's going to be a great falling away, I believe with all my heart, is not so much because of, of, of a lack of, of discipleship, though that will exist. It will be a lack of commitment because people will love themselves more than they love the Lord. Now, I'm not saying this is what you're doing. Don't get me wrong, okay? But how many of you all ever really truly read those new terms and conditions agreements that come out with these updates to iPhones and Facebook and all this stuff? Anybody? Anybody at all? All right? And you do realize that a lot of the privacy stuff we're concerned about is all nestled down in those things. And you put your little, you check the box and push accept and the update downloads and you've literally put an e-signature on the fact that you don't care what they do. Because of why? You want the service. You want the convenience. You want the ability. And here's the problem. Our world knows that. And so one of these days, your faithfulness to God is going to stand in opposition to the conveniences you enjoy. And here's the question. Is God still God in those moments? Or, or is God going to be put to the side for the sake of your convenience and enjoyment in this life? That's going to determine your resilience. Because what the devil has done is so crafty. He's made us all love to be so comfortable in this world. We love our comfort. We love our convenience. We love how things move and how things roll. And if we don't have it for 15 minutes, I mean, even the internet, if our phone takes an extra 10 seconds to download a web page, we lose our minds. What's wrong with my phone? What's... Turn it off, turn it on, knocking on something, you know? What's going on? Why, why can't I... We want it right now. I'm sorry, we, uh, we don't have your particular kind of milk today at the commissary. What? I like this brand. I can't, I can't have the lesser brand. I must have this brand. I don't like that cereal. I must. I don't want this cereal. I don't want Frosted Flakes or Raisin Bran. I want Cocoa Puffs. And if I can't have Cocoa Puffs, well, I'm gonna cry about it. We love our preferences. We cling to them with bitter fingers. And if someone takes them away from us, life has become miserable. It's a mark of a covetous age that longs for convenience. And it is that bend that breaks resilience and ushers in an age of cowing to everything the Antichrist is going to put out there. If we're going to be resilient and train our young ones to be resilient in the face of these last days, it will be because we teach them to, yes, stand firmly on the strength of God's word and God's doctrine, but to do so with an unwavering spirit of resilience and faith in God, that no matter what the cost is, I'm going to do right because to do right is right, and God is good, and God is worthy of my allegiance to Him. 
There are three great enemies in this world to that resilience. Three great resistors of the will and work of God. 1 Peter 5.18 gives us some inclination to the one called the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist set fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Christian, you cannot thrive in mediocrity and convenience. And so when God allows seasons of difficulty in your life, don't fret over them. Embrace them with thankfulness. You're leaning in the grace of God. The devil wants to devour your life. And so he tries to sift you like he sifted Peter. But God intends to strengthen your life even in the midst of opposition, if you let him. But the devil will resist the will and work of God in your life. Romans chapter 8, verses 5-9 through nine, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Understand, the flesh and the devil stand in opposition to God. You say, what is the flesh? We went through a series on this on Wednesday nights for a while, a while back. But the flesh is that part of you that is not subject to the redeeming power of the Spirit of God in your life. It's all it's it's it's, it's your emotions your passions. It's that emotional side of you. Uh, it, it's the part of you that when you see a, a commercial for a McDonald's Big Mac and, you, and you're into that, you think, man, i got to go to McDonald's right now. When you, have, when you walk in the store and you're walking by the commissary and you're like, man, I'm trying to I got a lot of food. I'm going to be taking in this next several couple months. I got to be a good boy. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to miss out on that Christmas ham. So I'm going to not eat those Oreos. And I walk by the Oreo aisle. I see the Oreos sitting there. And I got double stuffed Oreos in that day. You say, mm, 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 I could use some double stuffed Oreos right now. And you're spinning. The spirit says, No, you better not. You glut. And you say, and The flesh says, Oh yes, you better because it tastes good. That's a that's, that's a light illustration, but it's how it works. Your flesh lusts against your spirit and your spirit against your flesh so that you can't do the things that you would. Your flesh is prone to, to passions, desires, emotionalism, and it likes to be pampered and it likes to be catered to. And when Jesus Christ saved you by His death, burial, and resurrection, He redeemed your spirit and soul to God, but he, your flesh you still dwell in. And that's why you're called to resist your flesh. Your flesh stands against the will and work of God. You say, how do you know that? Because Sunday morning rolls around and church starts at, the Sunday school starts at 10, you roll over and look at that alarm clock and say, mm, 10 more minutes. I don't got to go today. Oh man, you better wake up and read your Bible. Oh yeah, but that means I got to get up 45 minutes earlier. Mm, I really like my sleep. Your flesh lusts against your spirit and your spirit against your flesh. Your flesh fights the things of God. Doesn't want to follow God. And one day, praise God, he's going, to, he's going to free you from this flesh. You're not bound to the power of the flesh. Don't get me wrong. Because the rest of the verse says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. When you get born again, you get the Spirit of God in your life. And you are not bound to follow the to, to, uh, cow to the flesh. That's a decision you have to make. You've been given freedom by Jesus Christ. James 4 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whoso therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You see, the world, the flesh, and the devil all stand as three resistors in opposition to the work and will of God. And Christian, you will face this, this opposition every single day of your life. You say, man, that just makes me so happy. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It doesn't make you happy. 
Why? Because who wants to face opposition every single day? Especially opposition that's going to test your moral fibers and your character. We all want to have moments of peace. We want freedom. We, want, we just want to have ease. But therein lies the problem. Because we live in a world that stands in opposition to all we are in Jesus Christ. How does the devil do this? How does, how does the devil resist and oppose? Well, let's go to Matthew 4 and see how he opposed Jesus during his temptation. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4, not Mark 4. Matthew 4, verse 1, Then was Jesus led up into the, uh, led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Um, some of us go two days and we think we're going we're to die, right? Jesus went 40 days and 40 nights without eating, and, and, and I think he was hungry. Amen. Verse 4, or verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Can I ask you a question? Is bread sinful? No. No. That's not. We eat all the time with curry. Would, would the action of turning stones into bread by Jesus the Creator been sinful? Mm-hmm. Outside of this context, no. He can make. He can do what he wants to do. He's God, right? He can make. If he want to make a stone of bread, who are we to tell God what not to do? Amen. Yeah. Here's the problem. In the context of the situation, Jesus had spent forty days and forty nights fasting before the Lord, before the Father. Now he was hungry, and the tempter said, "Hey, Jesus, you're the Son of God, aren't you? You deserve to be full." Why are you hungry? You, you don't deserve to be like this. So I tell you what, see these stones over here? Why don't you just make yourself some bread? You don't need to wait for you don't need to wait for God to provide for you. You just get it yourself. In that moment, he was tempting Jesus to satisfy his own desires and, and dreams because he felt like he deserved it because of what he had done. And sometimes we do that with God too, don't we? Well, God, I go to church, and God, I serve, and God, I do this, and here I am. There's an area of my life that's lean, and I feel hungry for something else. And God, you're not meeting my needs. I'm going to find it my own way. Uh Uh-oh. Sometimes the Lord lets you get lean in life, not so you can go and figure out how to meet your own needs, but so you can learn that He will provide in His own way in His time. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We don't need handouts. We need to hold out and let God provide. Verse 6 and 7. Uh, he said, and, or verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him up on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall uh, give his angels charge concerning thee, and in, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. What does the devil try to tempt him with here? He says, hey, just test the Lord and see if He's worthy of your faithfulness. Well, just test God and see if He's true. What does Jesus reply? He says, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. Thou shalt, as it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If Jesus tripped and, and fell, if, if Jesus was walking down and just tripped on a stone, would that have been wrong? No. But when He puts Himself in the position to willfully cast himself down to test whether God's faithful or not. That's sin. The same is true for you and I, Christian. When you put yourself in a situation, rather you put God in a situation where where he has to prove himself to you or you're not going to be faithful, you have elevated your philosophies and your desires above God and you have committed heresy. Be careful. Hey, when we want convenience and we want uh, to be comfortable, 
sometimes we'll put we'll, we'll do things that put us in really bad situations all because we wanted to have our way and not God's way but there's a third test that Satan gives me says here he says just uh, verse number eight again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me this is probably the most devilish of the deceptions he tries before the Lord Jesus Christ why? because Jesus Christ came to redeem mankind from sin Jesus by humbling himself will be exalted as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Philippians chapters 1 and 2. And yet, here the devil literally says, hey, Jesus, I'll leave them alone and give them to you willingly if you'll just worship me. In other words, you don't have to go God's way. Get God's will your way. Do it in your own power. Do it in your own wisdom. Just follow me. And I'll make it easy. Sometimes we miss out on the blessings of growth that God has for us because we try to sidestep God's plan for us to do what we think we should be doing and not what God has us doing. The devil doesn't come out and just say, hey, I'm going to deceive you today. (laughs) I wish he would. But he will use the most subtle of means to try to get you off track. If you want to get somebody, if you want to, if you want to get somebody off track, you don't put left turn here. You just move the road a little bit. You keep moving it this way, just so a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit before long. What have you done? You completely turned in an entire different direction. The devil wins victories in inches, not in yards. In your life, you give him an inch. Eventually, he'll take a mile. The same is true with Job. The devil told God, he said, look, Job, Job doesn't, what, does Job fear you for not? You bless everything he has, you protect him, you give him, you, he's, he's well off because of you, God. He's healthy. If you take away everything that he's got, he'll curse you your face. Job loses everything. What does he say? Naked came out of this world. Naked will, naked will I go out. Bless be the name of the Lord. Job said, all of God is undeserved. Nothing he held in this world, though it may have been nice to have, was a a, a, a non-negotiable. Though he lost everything, he still was choosing to be faithful. Satan says, ask skin for skin. Yeah, whatever. But you touch Job's life, you touch his health, then he'll curse you. Because at least he has his health right now. The devil touches his, touches Job and afflicts him with boils over his body. You've seen boils. Uh, I invite you, do not look it up, okay? It's awful, okay? Terrible disease. He scrapes the putrid flesh off his skin. Sits there in ashes. And his wife comes to him. This is how the devil does it. You mark it down. This is how he does it. He puts you in a situation where you're miserable and then he brings somebody you trust you think you can trust alongside to push you over the edge. Job was sitting there struggling and his wife came to him and said, Job! She was in her own grief. She'd lost her children. She'd lost her lifestyle. she lost everything. Her life was had been just as turned upside down as Job's life had been. And she was struggling. And the devil got into her mind and said, see, look at your foolish husband. Look at him. He's sitting there in, his, in ashes and putridness. Look at him. And he still wants to be faithful to God. Why don't you go help him out? She comes in there and says, Job, you retain your integrity. Just curse God and die. He's not worth your faithfulness. Just curse him. And he says to her, you speak like one of the foolish women. Almost, you almost hear his shock. Who is this person? Who, who are you? Shall we not receive good at the hand of the Lord and also evil? Is God, does God just owe us to always do good things for us? No. God can lead unfortunate things into our lives too because they're for our benefit. And later on, Job would say those great words. He'd say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. 
Christian, if you're going to be resilient, if you're going to stand in the face of opposition in this life, whether it be at work or in your home or with your family on the phone and Skype, they're going, to, they're going to resist your philosophies that are biblical. They're going to resist your lifestyle that's biblical. They're going to resist you. I'm telling you, Christian, if you're not anchored in the faithfulness of God and if you're not anchored in trusting Him and letting Him be your define, definer, letting Him be your equipper, then you will not be resistant. You will eventually cave. We're going to close in just a minute here. But, but look in 1 John chapter 2 with me. And look what John says. First John chapter 2. He says in verse 15. Love not the world. Let's go to verse 14 rather. I have written to you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abideth in you. Do you see the correlation there? Biblical thinking leads to spiritual strength. And yet overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We are not called to love the world. Rather, we are called to embrace God and a great love for Him. The world offers us the lust of the flesh. The world wants to make you feel good. And if you live to feel good, that's called hedonism. And it is ungodly. Our culture today wants to feel good. Whatever floats your boat, they say. Whatever feels good, do it. I'm telling you, that's ungodly. The lust of the eyes. What is alluring and, and takes your attention away from a fixation upon Jesus Christ. The pride of life. The ability to say, well, I've been there, done that. You should listen to me. Oh, really? Because you're the arbiter of all knowledge and wisdom? I don't think so. Because we don't live up the lust of the flesh. We long for the Spirit. We don't live the lust of the eyes. We fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. And we don't live to be wise in our own deceit. Rather, we live to be wise in the Lord and His Word. That's the contrast that God calls us to, but you can only be that way when you live as God's people always have, forsaking this present world, not longing for it. Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. You see, they had received the promises of God that God had something prepared for them, that God had a better thing for them, that God had something waiting for them in heaven. And they were persuaded of the promises. They embraced them by faith. They embraced the promises and let them be a part of their lifestyle. And they not only made them a part of their life, but they confessed to the world that they were strangers and pilgrims in this present world. And so because of that, it says, they now desire a better country, verse 16, that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Every disciple of Christ has to make the decision on for who or for what they will live for. And really, that decision will reveal in a greater sense to whom your heart truly belongs. Demas had a good run. He did a lot of ministry, did a lot of good things. But by the time we get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, we read this. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Young people, listen to me. The devil offers you pleasure, abundance, and false success. And you might have prominence in this life, 
You might have resources. You might have fiscal prosperity. You might even seem to have some wisdom. But I'm telling you, it is a facade. Because the minute your soul breaks the plane of eternity, it'll all be nothing. And right now, it is so tempting because we've, we've sat in your seat. You look around and you see some of us older than others. Look, even Brother LT was 12 years old at one point in time. <laughs> Say it ain't so, right? Look, We've been there. We know what it means to want your friends to like you and to want to be successful and to want to have money and to want to be comfortable and to want to have these things. But I'm telling you, what God has for you is better by far than what this devil can ever offer you. And the world will try to trap you in a cycle of destruction. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you it's always going to be good days. It's just not. Look at look at look around the room at the adults in here. I, I challenge you, young person, ask the adults, have you gone through hard days? And they'll tell you they have. But you ask a mature child of God who's an adult who's been through those dark days, and they'll tell you, God's grace met me every single time. God is good. As one preacher once said, all the time. And if you don't know, you better ask somebody. Because there's people around you that know how good God is because they've walked with God a few miles. But just because you've walked with God a few miles don't mean your trajectory is in the right direction. Because Demas walked with God a few miles too, but he got, fell infatuated with this world and he got sidetracked and shipwrecked because he fell in love with this present world. You say, yeah, but if I, if I don't think about this world and don't prepare for this world, then I won't have this, I won't have that. That's the point. You don't need this or that. Who you need is Jesus. And if you happen to get this or that along the way, praise God. But if you don't have it, praise God. Because the point is not to have this or that. The point is to, put, to put, point people to Him. That's the point. And you will not be resilient unless you embrace that reality. It'll just be a ticking time bomb waiting for you to, be, to meet the shoals of destruction just like Demas did. Someone's going to say something. Someone's going to do something. Life's going to throw something at you and you won't be able to handle it because you didn't give it to God. And the devil knows just what you need to put you on that trajectory. How about it this morning, Christian? Are you resilient? Because one, you're anchored in the truth of God's word. Oh, no deception is going to get you because you're anchored in your 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 step, your base of truth in the word of God, and you filter everything through the word of God. But number two in our series, are you resilient? Because you've chosen that not only will you anchor your hope for truth in the word of God, but are you choosing to stand firmly in living the word of God, regardless of the opposition? Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to you now. We thank you for the day.